And welcome to Living Truth, a media ministry of the People's Church. Wherever you're tuning in from, we're thrilled that you've decided to join us for our time of worship as we grow in God's Word together. We're so glad to be back together for week two of our series, Act Like Men. Let's tune in together to hear what God has for us through Pastor Brett this week. Good morning, church. Please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 16. We'll be looking there in a moment. Over the last couple weeks, we've been looking at a two-part series entitled Act Like Men. We're going to take up part two today. And this all comes from this strange little verse that's in the concluding remarks of Paul's letter to the Corinthian church. He's signing off, he's talking about travel plans and personal greetings and receiving people, and then he makes this statement, be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. Last week, we looked at how a godly man stands guard, stands firm, and stands strong. And would you permit me again today to address my brothers? I want to speak specifically to some of the things that we as men encounter in the marketplace, in our families, as husbands, fathers. Paul calls us to these things, but then in verse 14, he tells us how we're to live those out, the tone and temperament of our lives. Look at what he says in verse 14. Let all that you do be done in love. That's how we're to live into those three commands. Let all that you do has a twofold application. Paul's speaking to them in community. Let all that you do, all of you in community as one, and all that you do, all that you live out, be done in love. May the entirety of your life, your words, your actions, your behaviors, reflect the love of Christ. Now, earlier in his letter to the church, in chapter 13, Paul gives detailed instructions about how love should show up in our lives. And so we're going to step into that chapter. But brothers, I want you to hear this as a call up, not a call out. The heart of the Father is to produce these things in us. Amen? And I said a few weeks ago, God's been speaking to me personally through this verse. This this verse has come to me, but it's not just for me. I believe it's for all of us. Now, I want to acknowledge up front that we're going to go into some tough places this morning in 1 Corinthians 13, and Paul's speaking about spiritual gifts and how they're to be practiced in the church. We're going to look at some of that, but we're going to look at how this shows up in the marketplace. Because the principles are transferable. While he's speaking about spiritual gifts, these behaviors can also make their way into other parts of our lives, in the marketplace, in the boardroom, in our families. Paul opens 1 Corinthians 13 with three personas or personalities. Look at what he says. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Paul describes three types of people, not as a comprehensive list, 
but more as examples of what he's driving home. And for simplicity's sake, let's categorize them. Let's say Paul's talking about speakers, scholars, social justice warriors, or servants. And I would suggest that in all three personas, you see the same pattern. They are all searching for significance. They're on a quest to impress, but in a way that is rooted in their own self-importance. And I want to look at how this can show up actually in the marketplace in our lives. Let's start with the speakers. I think Paul would equally say to us, if, if I have the gift of communication and I can present information in a compelling way, if I can move people with my words and they are left in awe of my charisma and what they've heard, and, and maybe even they've heard wisdom from heaven. I'm, I'm speaking heavenly language, but it leaves others in the marketplace feeling less than, and I appear somehow superhuman, then I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I can amaze others in the marketplace with my intellect, and my ability somehow to lob up information and figure out complex problems. Maybe I'm even the smartest person in the room and seemingly have all the answers. But it leaves the rest of the team feeling uncertain about their own contributions or insecure about their abilities, then I have gained nothing. If I am generous and sacrificial, and leading the way in charitable donations, surrendering my own body to the flames as I pour it out in the service of others, but the rest of the team can't keep pace with me, or, or they feel less than holy because they've got to take some time out for themselves, or if the recipients of my charitable work feel patronized and marginalized, and I feel a sense of superiority, superiority because of how charitable I am, then I have gained nothing. All three people are searching for significance. And it's not unlike the journey we face in life, in our careers, in the marketplace. We may be the best communicator, we may be the smartest person in the room, or the most generous and in the marketplace, we're considered rock stars for those behaviors. But if we come home and use the same communication skills to tear down our wife or belittle our children, or if we use our keen intellect to win every argument in the family, or we sacrifice our families on the altar of endless productivity, even for the sake of generosity, then we have gained nothing. We are only a resounding gong and a clanging cymbal in the ears of heaven. Now, now Paul is stating that this exists within the church in the area of spiritual gifts, so how much more so can it show up in other parts of our lives? But even as we look around the church in our world, we see the truth and impact of these personas. We're drawn to the gifted communicators, to those who seemingly have a bit of charisma, who move us with their words and ideas. We stand in awe of the apologists who can fathom all mysteries and have God-given wisdom to answer difficult questions in the faith. We're inspired by the social justice warriors, by those who serve others and are charitable. But when their lives are not built on the foundation of God's love, we see that their fall from grace can be devastating as it splashes across the headlines. The, the whole thing can come crashing down like a clanging cymbal or a resounding gong. Th there is a search for significance, that's a battle that we all face. The, the search to make something of your life and stand out from the crowd is common to all of us. And our world worships it. We celebrate it. We love to put it on a platform and make a celebrity out of it. 
But if the foundations of that quest are rooted in yourself, then you are set up for an epic fail in your life. I'm not saying that working hard and wanting to make something out of your life is a bad thing. By all means, work hard in your career, get educated, expand your knowledge and wisdom. But if it is unmoored from the love of God and is rooted in your own ego, it becomes a quest in futility. What would the world look like? What would the church look like if its leaders weren't characterized by the personas of verses one through three, but were rather measured by the beauty of verses four through eight? You see, our world worships the personas. It celebrates and enshrines those personas. But what our world really needs is love, not superhuman persona. It's like, it's like the song. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. Love is what will change the world, not celebrity. Let all that you do be done in love. And then Paul describes what that would look like in our world. Look at what he says in verse four. Love is patient. Love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. You might be gifted and respected, respected, but are you kind? You might be a really good communicator in the boardroom and others are like amazed at how you string words together, but do you go home and tear down your wife afterwards? You may be really educated, smartest person in the room, but again, are you using your knowledge to build others up around you? See, the scriptures say, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Are you puffing up, or are you building others up around you? Paul's describing what matters most in life. And many of us don't get past the first statement. I mean, look at what he opens with. Love is patient. What? Come on. Paul clearly didn't know what the 401 is like. Many of us don't even get past the first word. Love is patient. Oh, great. I got places to go, people to see, and there's someone driving slow in the fast lane. Don't you know the left lane is for passing? Get out of my way. But Paul is saying love isn't in a hurry or a rush. You see, we become unsettled when we have to wait for something. When others get in our way, we become unkind, we become impatient, we start to lash out. And the opening verse tells us that love isn't self-centered, it is others-centered. Love puts the needs of others ahead of its own. Not in a way that seeks to call attention to itself for how sacrificial it is, but in a genuine way to build others up. Paul continues in verse five, look at what he says. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love isn't easily offended. It's not seeking to shame the other person. In fact, it's working to keep their honor intact. It's not keeping score in life. It seeks to build others up. You know, Paul writes in Ephesians 6, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and centered her needs above his own. He feeds her, washes her, cares for her. In the same way, husbands, love your wives. And sometimes we're in danger of getting life all twisted up and backwards, thinking that we somehow are entitled and that the world revolves around us. You know, sometimes we measure our lives by our persona at work where we may be affirmed for how we're maneuvering in that space, but then we come home with our tired lives to our family and our family reflects back to us how we're really doing in our love life and we don't respect it. We don't receive it. We bump up against it. Jesus is calling us to something higher, and it reveals our need of him to work this into our lives. And sometimes that work comes in the form of discipline. Oftentimes it does. 
Paul acknowledges, if you paid attention to the verse, that love sometimes gets angry. He said, love is not easily angered, but there are times where it can be roused or provoked to anger. Think of a parent who's having to discipline their child, and they're doing it from a place of love, like the child is reaching out for a boiling pot of water, they're curious, and the, the parent's having to restrain them from what they want to do. Now, the parent's doing it rooted in love, but it's cramping the kid's style, and the kid starts to cry. Paul helps us understand that love can be provoked to a righteous anger, and then he helps us understand how love can show up as discipline. Look at what he says in verse six. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. This is a game-changing statement to understand God's love. Because what it's saying is that love has boundaries. Love has a moral compass that is fixed on and informed by God's will. It acknowledges that there is good and evil in the world, that there is truth and there is deception. And love will not indulge in or delight in that which is evil. It, it won't entertain it, and it won't minimize its impact or the consequences that come attached to behaving in an evil way. It will speak truthfully about its consequences. And then he says, love rejoices with the truth. It will resist deception. It will dismantle the lies that we're holding on to and have warped how we're living out our lives. Now, as men and fathers, we are called to help our children in this form of love. We're to help them understand what is good, what is evil, what is truth, what is deception. And so it begs the question, how are you living into the, that aspect of God's love? As a father, you have a duty to your children to instruct them in the word, Help them make sense of what's going on in this world through the word of God. And that is crucial today because if you don't inform them about what is truth and deception, what is good and evil, the culture around us will. YouTube will, TikTok will. It'll give them a moral compass. It won't be aligned with God's word, but it'll give them something. Biblical love has boundaries that are informed by God's will. And God's love sometimes takes the form of discipline in our lives. It doesn't affirm everything that comes into our lives as true or good. And sometimes restricts our desires because in our culture, we often hear people talk about love as simply affirming everyone in every choice that they're making. But biblical love does not reflect that sentiment. It doesn't affirm everything is true or good. It makes distinctions between what is true and what is deception. Not because it wants to ruin our fun or cramp our life, but actually to set us free from the lies or sins that are keeping us bound and from who we were meant to be. When God's love comes in the form of discipline, it always comes in the way that is described in verse four. It shows up in a way that is loving and kind and patient. Love isn't in a rush to cultivate these things in you, but it does come to free you from the lies that you're holding on to. And as men, as fathers, we are called to do the same for our children alongside our wives. Sometimes that might be uncomfortable. It might cause hurtful conversations to take place. But in the end, it's meant to protect and preserve our children. And then Paul describes in his closing statement on love, love's tenacity. Look at what he says in verse 7 and 8. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. Love is relentless. It will always, always, always protect, trust, and persevere. Your goodness is running after, running after me. It, it never fails. 
If you're here this morning and you have a prodigal son or daughter, don't give up. Continue to pray for them. Continue to love on them. Continue to hold them up to our heavenly father who is in the business of chasing people down with his love because he is faithful to his covenant, to himself and to us. Don't give up. Continue to pray. I'm so grateful that my parents didn't stop praying for me even when I was running in the opposite direction of all things God. But here's what you need to understand about God. You're here this morning. You're hearing this. And he is relentless. His love always trusts, always protects, always perseveres. His love never fails. So you can stop playing the games. Stop trying to get under his skin and yield your life to this perfect love. Paul speaks about the process that we're all in when we call Jesus Lord. Because yes, his love welcomes us as we are, but his love also disciplines us to be conformed to his likeness. And Paul talks about that maturing process in verse 11. Look at what he says. When I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, and I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. You know, you look around our world today, and there's a lot of children trapped in adult bodies, amen? Like, there's a lot of adults out there behaving like children. Because when we're childish, we're centering our own needs. We want to be at the front of the line in business class. <clears throat> <laughs> we think the world does revolve around us when we're children. We want what we want when we want it. And we throw tantrums when we don't get it. But you look around our world today, and some of us are still living like children. When we're self-absorbed and searching for significance, rooted in our own desire to be important, we are like children playing musical instruments that's a resounding gong and a clanging cymbal. But as you get older, by God's grace and his activity in our lives, you begin to mature and realize how little you know and how hard it is to put these verses into practice. Paul reminds us of God's grace and his activity in our lives, and look at how he describes it. It's so beautiful, acknowledging our limitations and the process we're all in. He says, for now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now, I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. Paul is looking ahead to when Christ will return, and he's basically acknowledging some limitations. Now, we're, it's like we're looking in a mirror. Now, he's writing in a New Testament context in the ancient Near East. Mirrors were made out of polished bronze. They weren't very good. And so what he's saying is, now I see but a reflection as in a mirror. It's, it's not quite detailed. It's not high definition. I know in part, but I don't know fully. I reflect in part, but I don't reflect fully. But there is a day coming where he will come back for his bride, the church, and then I will see him face to face. And all the impurities, all the imperfections, they will disappear, and we will be made perfect in love. Isn't that a glorious day to look forward to? But he's saying to the church and to act like men, he's saying, fix your eyes on Jesus, love incarnate. Yes, you might not get it all perfect. Yes, you might not see clearly. Yes, there will be a process of this working its way into your life, but realize that his love always, always, always trusts, perseveres, and protects. His love never fails. And realize that he is calling you to put it into practice, not perfection. But one day you will see him face to face. And what a glorious day 
that will be. Let all that you do be done in his love, his power, his strength at work within you. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. And all my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake until I lay my head, oh, I will sing of the goodness. Sing all my life. Cause all my life you have been faithful. Yes, yes. Cause all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am made. And I will sing of the goodness of God. I love your voice. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire. In darkest nights, you are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. I have lived in the so much for being here. We hope that you've gained a deeper desire to see Jesus through the word this week. We'd love to help. Visit livingtruth.ca for resources like our daily devotionals and past sermons. We look forward to growing more with you very soon.